Welcome everybody. This is uh, the first lecture in my course on purification ethics and karma in early Buddhist discourse. So the source text that we will be working with, and this is what I've put here on the blackboard for you, is the Madhyama Agama that has been preserved in Chinese translation. This is entry number 26 in the Taisho edition. And this uh, discourse collection is a counterpart to the Majjhima Nikaya preserved in the Pali Canon. Now, one thing I think that is very important for us to keep in mind is that the original used for this Majjhima Agma translation has the same claim, has the same strength of claiming to be an authentic record of the teachings of the Buddha as the Majjhima Nikaya preserved in Pali. And it is this which makes uh, comparative studies of the discourses such an interesting affair. As from the outset, we never really know which of the parallel versions has preserved the more probable and therewith the more original account of the teachings. Now, I hope you can see this as I move down. I have to always read out everything I put on the blackboard for you because besides being taped as a video, the lecture is also being taped as a pure audio recording for some people, especially in Asia, that are, uh, whose internet connection is not good enough so they can only hear what I'm saying. So whatever I put there on the blackboard, I have to read it out also so that they get to know what I'm talking about. So this Madhyama, <coughs> excuse me, this Madhyama Agama translation was done by a Kashmirian monk by the name of uh, Gautama Sangadeva. And that was between 397 and 398 of the present era. He had a probably written original and my manuscript and that was read out to him by another Kashmiri monk. As far as we are able to reconstruct, this original was a discourse collection transmitted by the so-called Sarvasti Vada tradition. This is another of the early Buddhist schools similar to what we now refer to as the Theravada tradition, a school that was particularly present in the northwest of India. And as far as we can tell from the way how proper names have been translated and also from some of the translation errors. Uh, the original was probably in a Prakrit. Prakrit is an umbrella term for those uh, ancient Indian languages, one of which is also Pali. Uh, the translation <coughs> Excuse me. And the translation of the Madhyama Agama, as far as I am able to tell by having worked with it for quite some time, is a, is a very good translation. In fact, among the Agamas, I think, personally, I find this is probably the best translation. Uh, it was carried out by an Indian who knew about the text and about the type of text he was translating, but he had learned Chinese and he had a group of 40 scholar monks, Chinese scholar monks, that were present during the time of translation, asking questions, checking, etc. The Madhyama Agama translation that we have is not the first ever translation into Chinese. There was an earlier translation by Zhu Fonian and Dharma Nandin, uh, but this translation is no longer extant. So it seems that this translation was replaced by the translation done by Sangadeva. Now this Madhyama Agama collection translated by Sangadeva has 222 discourses in 18 chapters. The Majjhima Nikaya that we know has 152 discourses in 15 chapters. And the number of discourses that these two collections share in common are about 100. If we put them side by side, 
we find that mostly a chapter has 10 discourses. But this is not always the case. In the Majjhima Nikaya we have one that has more. And in the Majjhima Agon we have uh, several chapters that continue, contain considerably more than 10 discourses. And if you look at these chapters, we find that they only have four chapter headings in common. And I have made a little diagram here for you. So it's the chapters, <coughs> chapters on kings, chapters on Brahmins, on pairs, and on analysis. And as you can already see from the grouping of parallels, the chapter of kings shares only two discourses. The Brahmins and pairs only four, and it's only the chapter on analysis where a considerable number of discourses are found in both versions. But if you look at it more closely, you will see that even there the sequence is different. As you see, a Majjhima I listed according to the Pali version, we have 132, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. But then on the other side, the Madhyama Agama parallels come in quite a different sequence. So, what does it tell us? I think it tells us that these two collections draw on the same material but have arranged it quite differently. And it is this impression which we also get when we come to the first chapter, which is uh, what we will be studying very soon. I have now put the Madhyama Agama discourses on one side and you see on the other side the Anguttara Nikaya parallels. Madhyama Agama 7 has no Pali parallel, but 1 to 8 all have parallels among the 7s of the Anguttara. And the final two that have parallels in the Majjhima Nikaya are both discourses also concerned with 7 seven stages of purification and uh, seven ways of dealing with the influxes. <coughs> Excuse me. So basically when we look at this, the, the feeling we get is that this was originally a chapter of sevens and may have been even part of some Anguttara or a Kotarika collection and was later added to the Madhyama Agama. We have a somewhat similar case in the Majjhima Nikaya, where in that case it's the last chapter, the Salayatana Vaga, which has a number of very short discourses, all on the six senses, and all of the parallels to this Majjhima Nikaya chapter are found in the Chinese in the Samyukta Agama. So, while it is possible <coughs> that in the case of the Majjhima Nikaya, a whole group of discourses from a collected Samyutta collection was added at the end. In the Madhyama Agama we are studying now, it looks as if a whole group of discourses from an Angotrika, Anguttara, Ekotrika collection was added at the beginning. Now, I think it is important for us to know that this movement of discourses does not mean that these discourses are somewhat late. It only means that within the oral transmission, the discourses, the way they were arranged in collections, in groups, was not fixed from the outset, but was handled flexibly by the different reciters. And so, as these recited traditions separate from each other, each develop in its own way, and this is how we get these final results. I think at this point I want to uh, stop and ask for questions or comments. My problem sitting here in front of the computer is that I, I can't see you. <laughs> I don't know if I am reaching you, if it's understandable or not. And anyway, this uh, little introduction is a little dry. After that, we will get into the first discourse. But at this point, if you have any comments, if anything I said I didn't understand, if there are any questions, then please use the chat function and write in it.
<laughs> so the first comment, <coughs> I have to read them out for those who only listen. No question, but sounds not too good. <laughs> yeah, sounds not too good. I think in a way it sounds not too good as we cannot be totally sure. But on the other side, it is sounds good in a way because we know this is a genuine oral transmission with all its strength and all its vicissitudes. This is my, my personal feeling from comparative studies. If only 100 parallel suttas, what about the rest? Yeah, so there are a few of the 152 discourses in the Majjhima Nikaya <coughs> excuse me, that have no parallels. There are uh, several where we have parallels only in Sanskrit fragments or in other Chinese agamas or in Tibetan translation. This is a very good question and the point is that the point, the problem, <laughs> the problem is that uh, whereas, <coughs> excuse me please, whereas in the case of the Pali discourses, we have all collections of one traditions. We have the complete Theravada discourse set. In the case of those discourse collections of the other school, we do not have the complete set. The Chinese Agamas that we have are not from the same school. We have a Dirga Agama, a collection of long discourses that is from the Dharma Guptaka school. We have this Madhyama Agama, middle long discourses, which is probably Sarvastivada. We have a Samyukta Agama, a connected discourses. Uh, a full translation is from the Mula Sarvastivada. We have another partial one where the school, the school affiliation is under discussion. And the counterpart to the Anguttara Nikaya, the Ekotarika Agama that we have in Chinese translation uh, is doubtful school. We are still discussing that. <coughs> probably not Sarvastivada, probably not Mula Sarvastivada. Many scholars say Mahasangika, but this is being discussed. What is important for us to know is that these these, these collections we have from these these four collections from we have are all from different schools. So, for example, Jivaka Sutta, the Jivaka Sutta in the Majjhimanikaya, that is Majjhimanikaya, put put up 55, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think it's 55. <coughs> anyway, this Jivaka Sutta is not in the Chinese Madhyama Agama of the Sarvastivada school. In fact, we have no Chinese version of the Jivaka Sutta. But now, recently found Sanskrit fragments of the Sarvastivada, Mula Sarvastivada tradition from uh, Central Asia, we have a Sanskrit version. And that is found in the Dirga Agama of the Sarvastivada tradition. So it means our Jivaka Sutta, which in the Theravada tradition went into the middle long group, in the Sarvastivada tradition it went into the long group, the group of long discourses. And because that has not been translated into Chinese, we don't have a Chinese version. And the Dharmaguptaka school, whose long discourse collection we have, they did not allot their Jivaka Sutta to that collection. They might have also put it into their middle collection, like the Theravada school. So our Jivaka Sutta, as far as Chinese translators are concerned, it, it kind of fell between the chairs. And if we didn't find that Sanskrit fragments very recently discovered, we would think there's no parallel to this Sutta. This is important for us in so far as we, when a discourse has no parallel at all, this does not necessarily mean that this discourse is spurious or late or something. It just means that through the vicissitudes of transmission and translation, a version of this discourse has not reached us. I hope this was not too long a reply to a good question. <laughs> Are there any other questions about this first part?
Another question, those suttas without Pali Paral, are they available in translation? Well, the whole of the Madhyama Agama so far is not available in translation, but I am um, one of the editors and one of the translators involved in translating this uh, collection. There's a, a Japanese um, foundation, the Numata Foundation, who is sponsoring the translation of a Chinese canonical text into English. And they have given the task of translating the entire Madhyama Agama to a friend and colleague of mine, Markus Bingenheimer. He is in Taiwan at the Dhammadram Buddhist College. And he, uh, Professor Rod Bucknell from Australia and myself are the editors of this translation project. And uh, Markus and myself are also translating parts ourselves. And we have finished the first volume. This should hopefully be coming out this year or the next year. And the other two volumes, uh, because Marcus is very busy, he has stepped down. So I will be the chief editor for the remainder. And the other two volumes to complete the whole translation, I think, will take us each another two years. So by the time of publication of this uh, translation, you will also get those suttas without a Pali parallel. But for the time being, the only way to get to know about them is to join my course. <laughs> because uh, I'll be t telling you about them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good, then I think after this first a little bit dry introduction into the Madhyama Agama as a discourse selection as a whole, we will now take a look at the first discourse. And this is already quite a challenging one because we have, it's a complex discourse and we have uh, a number of differences there. So the discourse is on seven dharmas. <coughs> Excuse me, the chapter on seven dharmas. This is the first discourse. <coughs> Excuse me. Discourse on wholesome qualities, and it's the parallel to the Dhammanyu Sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, among the sevens, the 64th discourse, which you can find in the PTS edition, volume 4, page 113. So uh, the discourse starts with the traditional opening of a discourse which in the Anguttara Nikaya we do not have. Thus have I heard at one time and the Buddha was staying at Savati in Jita's Grove, Anahata Pindika's Park. This is probably the most uh, frequently mentioned place where the Buddha stayed, the famous park given by the uh, lay disciple Anahata Pindika. According to a tradition, the story grows that uh, this grove was in the possession of a prince who was not willing to part with it. And so Anata Pindika had the whole ground of this grove covered with golden coins so that he could buy the land and construct a place for the Buddha to stay in Savati. <coughs> so here comes the first um, para of the discourse itself. At that time, the Blessed One addressed the monks. If a monk achieves seven qualities, then he will attain joy and happiness in the path of the Noble Ones and will progress rightly towards the cessation of the taints. So already here we find a little difference. The Pali version does not speak of the cessation of the taints. These are also sometimes called the influxes, the asavas. But instead says that if a monk has these uh, seven qualities, he becomes worthy of offering and he becomes an unexcelled field of merit for the world. This um, sets a slightly different theme as in the Pali version, the issue is about being a source of merit. In the Madhyama Agama version, we get more this uh, feeling of uh, 
getting joy and happiness by practicing the path and progressing towards liberation. Now the Madhyama Agama version lists those seven qualities and I have now, <coughs> excuse me please, I have now departed a little bit uh, from uh, the discourse because I'm adding numbers here. These are obviously not found in the discourse itself, but I'm trying to make things a little bit more easy for us to see. So these seven qualities are that uh, a monk, and here I first should perhaps say that the expression monk or bhikkhu in the early discourses is not meant to restrict the instructions to monastics or to males, uh, but much rather it mentions those who in the hierarchical situation are on top, which are the monks, as representative for whoever is engaging in the practice. So these seven qualities are that a monk or a nun or a lay disciple or a lady lay disciple should know the Dharma, the meaning, the proper time, restraint, himself, assemblies and he know, or she should know persons according to their superiority. Now when we put this first listing side by side with the Pali version as you can see here below, we already see there are some differences and these differences are typical for orally transmitted literature. I have found uh, very frequent instances of that that we get pretty much the same exposition but somehow the sequence varies. <coughs> As you see here, I have put uh, in brackets the corresponding numbers of the Madhyama Agama version. You see numbers 1, 2 and numbers 6 and 7 are in the same place. But numbers 5 and 3 have exchanged place and number 4 is actually a little different. It's actually quite different. So we have one quality which is totally different actually and we have two qualities which are the same but they come in the opposite place. In my own comparative studies I have found this uh, very significant uh, that there are so many sequential variations but usually I mean in this case we have one real difference but sometimes you have no difference as far as the content is concerned and often enough I also found that there is no there's no real advantage of one sequence over the other. There's no, I mean, if I have to think of why should somebody want to change this, what, what benefit do they get, it's, uh, it's a little difficult to find such benefits. And my own conclusion from studying these instances is very much that these are just natural errors that happen during oral transmission. Like somebody tells us five things and we still remember those fives, but hang on, did you say that second or third place? I'm not really sure. So things can, can get mixed up in the sequence, but we still preserve the same material. So now we come to the first quality. <coughs> Excuse me for all this coughing. I hope next week I'll be better. How does a monk know the Dharma? A monk knows, and now we get a listing of angas in Pali of limbs of types of texts. So the Madhyama Agama version and I have put in brackets the Pali words for those of you who are familiar with these. It lists discourses, stanzas, expositions, verses, causes, inspired utterances, heroic tales, what has been thus said, birth stories, answers to questions, marvels and explanations of meaning. These are 12 altogether and this is a um, standard uh, presentation that we find in the so-called Northern Buddhist schools that they list 12 whereas our Anguttara version has only nine of these. I'm not going to read them again. According to our knowledge, the ninefold listing is quite probably the original one. 
and this was later expanded into this 12-fold listing we get in the Madhyama Agama. Now, these angas are, have been a topic of considerable scholarly discussion. And at the present point, I am not going to get into that. Again, my problem, as I said earlier, I can't see you. I don't know how much I am able to reach you. And I don't want to overburden this first lecture with too much of theoretical and intricate and complex issues. At the end of the discourse, I want also to have a discussion on what the discourse practically means for us so that uh, the whole thing stays a little alive. But now, especially for those who later listen to this lecture, I would very much appreciate if on the blog that we have on our website, you express your opinion. If you wish me at a future time, next or third lecture, to go more into these angles. There are in particular a uh, theory based on only three angles and only four angles, one by Master Inchun from Taiwan and the other by Professor von Hinüber. And in each of these two cases I could say something more on these theories, on my personal hold on these theories, but for the time being I think I just briefly touch on what these are according to the commentary and then just continue with our Madhyama Agama number one so that we do not get tracked down too much into this more theoretical topics. So first, discourses. Here I'm following the Anguttara Nikaya listing. It's just uh, discourses spoken by the Buddha in general. Then stanzas, gaya, <coughs> suppose according to tradition, refers to when there is a discourse that has also some verses, combined with verses. Then uh, expositions would be uh, discourses without any verses. Then pure verses, gada, would be just verses themselves. Inspired utterances is when uh, we have a collection under that name in the Pali Canon, when uh, some particular occurrence inspires a saying which could be in verse but needs not be in verse. Itivutaka, we again have a collection of that type in the Pali Canon. Uh, it's basically, they have a specific introduction. Uh, thus is what it was said, Wutang Iti, kind of quotations in a way. Birth stories, Jataka, these are stories of the Buddha in a past life, his experiences during past lives. Uh, canonical uh, Jatakas we have in the discourses where the Buddha is in his past life a human. Then we have a Jataka collection, <coughs> excuse me, in the Pali Canon. The canonical part are the verses, uh, a commentarial part are the stories, and in these stories the Buddha also is identified with animals, different animals in past lives. Then we have marvels, Abhuta Dhamma, marvelous occurrences, marvelous qualities of the Buddha and some of his chief disciples, and Vedala, answers to questions or discussions. To these, the 12-fold listing adds the uh, Nidana causes, that is uh, basically the introduction to a discourse uh, that gives some information on the setting, and Apadana, heroic tales, these are tales usually involving uh, the narratives of former lives of disciples to show the working mechanics of karma. And then the last in the listing, explanations of meaning, upadesha. This is kind of philosophical expositions. Whatever meaning these different terms have, they seem to stand for different types of texts or different collections. Academics discuss on it. I personally think it's just types of text. And they are just meant to say teaching of the Dharma in different ways. <coughs> so the Madhyama Agama discourse tells us that if a monk does not know the Dharma, 
that is to say, does not know the discourses, stanzas, expositions, verses, causes, inspired utterances, heroic tales, what has been thus said, birth stories, answers to questions, marvels and explanations of meaning, then such a monk is one who does not know the Dharma. But, in the truly repetitive style of the discourses, we are now told that if a monk knows the Dharma well, that is to say he knows the discourses, and I spare you the rest, etc., until explanations of meaning, then such a monk is one who knows the Dharma well. So basically, knowing the Dharma here is defined as acquaintances with the texts. Now we come to the second quality. <coughs> How does a monk know the meaning? A monk knows the meaning of various explanations. The meaning is this, the meaning is that. I think there is not much for me to say to that. That is quite straightforward. It just means that one really understands what somebody else is telling us. The third quality, the Chinese version, the Madhyama Agama version, <coughs> how does a monk know the proper time? A monk knows this is the time to develop the characteristic of settling, this is the time to develop the characteristic of arousing, and this is the time to develop the characteristic of equanimity. It's interesting because in the Anguttara parallel version we get four different qualities. There, the knowing of the proper time is to know the time when it's time to recite, to ask questions, to make an effort, and to go into seclusion. Now, the three aspects that the Madhyama Agama version presents us, the settling, rousing and equanimity, we have a similar listing also in Pali discourses. There is a discourse in the Anguttara Nikaya called the Nimitta Sutta. This is page 256 of the first volume of the PDS edition. And there we are told that somebody who meditates should from time to time give attention to the Samadhi Nimitta, the characteristic of settling in the Madhyama Arma version, to the Paggaha Nimitta, the characteristic of arousing in the Madhyama Arma version, and to the Upekka Nimitta, the characteristic of equanimity. So the Listing we get in the Madhyama Agama as such is also found elsewhere in the Pali Canon, but not in the actual parallel to this discourse. And if we put these two versions now side by side, the Madhyama Agama three qualities and the Anguttara the four qualities, we see that the Madhyama Agama wants us to know the proper time especially in regard to meditation. These ideas of settling, arousing, and equanimity are especially related to the meditation practice. They basically mean when I have to know when to aim for more calmness. I have to know when to give it a little push, when to put in a little bit more energy. And I also have to know when I should not interfere with the way the mind is developing in the practice right now. I just should watch it with equanimity. Our Anguttara Nikaya version has a more broader perspective. It has the practice of meditation as its last under seclusion. One usually goes into seclusion to meditate but it has a more general context of development and growth in the Dharma that is the recitation which means uh, what one has heard to repeat that for oneself the only way they had in an oral culture to keep the text alive there was no book where one could quickly look up no internet nothing questioning 
this is the second step that based on having learned a text we we need we need to understand it by asking questions asking questions to ourselves and eventually also to others if we don't understand or to clarify <coughs> excuse me and then that is not enough then one has to also make an effort to put those teachings into practice and uh, the way to really do that is meditation withdraw into seclusion not the only way but uh, for early Buddhism uh, a central aspect of development if I look at these two <coughs> sorry from a comparative perspective I'm simply not able to tell you which one is the original I think both make sense both are things that one should know the proper time for so we just as it sometimes said we just have to let both versions stand side by side quality number four <clears throat> I read again how does a monk know restraint a monk knows restraint when having discarded sloth and torpor he practices clear comprehension while drinking eating going standing sitting lying down speaking keeping silent defecating or urinating this is completely different in the Pali version instead our Anguttara Nikaya version speaks of moderation moderation with the four requisites of robes arms food dwelling and medicine that as a monastic we should not overtax those who offer these to us and know when it is enough again we could probably make an argument for both versions I personally have a predilection for the Anguttara version it seems to me m more important as a, as a wholesome quality to take care of the fact that we don't overdo it when others help us and support us it's a very important quality specifically for a monastic whereas the practice of clear comprehension is more carrying continuing with mindfulness and clear comprehension doing various activities this is more something pertains particularly to the meditation area and I, I do not fully see it fits its context so well but you are free to disagree after we have gone through the discourse we will have our discussion and please challenge me on that if you if you feel that the Madhyama Agama version makes more sense. Quality number five. Uh, I read again from the Madhyama Agama. How does a monk know himself? A monk knows of himself, I have such faith, such virtue, such learning, such generosity, such wisdom, such eloquence, such knowledge of the canonical text, and such attainments. When we look at the Pali parallel, we find that faith, virtue, learning, generosity, wisdom and eloquence are also mentioned. But knowledge of canonical texts and attainments is something only found in the Madhyama Agama. What I find interesting about this, independent whether we include now the knowledge of the text and of one's attainments, is that as one of the recommendable wholesome qualities we are told to know our own good qualities we should not only look at our mistakes we should also look at our strength and we should know hey I'm good at that I have this I find this is uh, very uh, from a practical perspective I find this is a very important point that these two discourses are making here quality number six how does a monk know assemblies a monk knows this is an assembly of warriors 
this is an assembly of Brahmin, this is an assembly of householders, this is an assembly of recluses. And that type of assembly, I ought to walk like this, stand like this, sit like this, speak like this, keep silent like this. This is among who knows assemblies. There are no real diff major differences worthy of our note in the Pali parallel. The point that this sixth quality is making is that we have to have the wisdom to adjust our behavior to outward circumstances. So now we come to the last. <coughs> How uh, does a monk know persons according to their superiority? A monk knows that there are two types of persons, those who have faith and those who do not have faith. Those who have faith are superior, those who do not have faith are inferior. Now the discourse continues with this always contrasting two types and moves to the following topics. Of those who have faith, there are those who frequently go to see monks and who don't. Obviously, those who go to see the monks are superior. Again, superior of those who go to see are those who then pay their respects to the monks. And of those who pay their respects, the better ones are those who ask about the discourses. And of those who ask, the better ones are those who listen with concentration to the discourse. And of those who listen, the better ones are those who retain the Dharma that they have heard, who memorize it, who keep it in mind. Again, something that reminds us of the oral setting with which we are dealing and of the importance of remembering, recollecting, as one has no, no other way of retrieving that information later on. Then of those who retain the Dharma they have heard, the superior ones are those who also examine the meaning not merely passive reception of the teachings, but reflect, examine, try to understand. And of those who examine the meaning of the Dharma they have heard, <coughs> excuse me, still the superior ones of these are those who know the Dharma, know its meaning, progress in the Dharma, follow the Dharma, conform to the Dharma, and practice in accordance with the Dharma. Simply said, those who put things into practice. And of those who put things into practice, the superior ones are those who benefit themselves and benefit others, who benefit many people, who have a compassion for the world, seek advantage and benefit for gods and human beings, seek their peace and happiness. And the Madhyama Agama version contrasts this to those who neither benefit themselves nor others. The corresponding <coughs> Excuse me, Anguttara Nikaya listing does not mention faith that we had in first place, but then proceeds through a similar series that one wants to see the noble ones, and of those who want to see noble ones, the superior ones are those who want to hear the true Dharma. There's a question by somebody, so if you can type it into the chat box, because we had some problem with the microphone, I am for the time being only working with the chat box. And then later on we'll see if we can also use the micro function. So returning to the Anguttara uh, listing, wants to hear the true Dharma, the superior ones are those who listen with an attentive ear, those who have listened, the superior ones are those who remember it, and then the superior ones are those who examine it, again those who practice. And of those who practice it, the superior ones are those who practice for their own benefit and that of others. And this is contrasted to only benefiting oneself. So here we have a slight difference. Both versions agree that the superior ones are those who benefit themselves and others, but the Chinese version contrasts this to somebody who does not benefit others or himself or herself. In the Pali version we have benefiting both contrasted to benefiting oneself. Another difference is that the Madhyama Agama version 
gives us a simile to express, to illustrate this uh, sequence of superiorities. I read, it is just as from a cow comes milk, from milk comes cream, from cream comes butter, from butter comes ghee, and from ghee comes cream of ghee. And among these, cream of ghee is supreme, the greatest, the highest, the best, the superior one, the most excellent one, the most sublime. In the same way, if a person benefit themselves and benefit others, he is the supreme, the greatest, the highest, the best, the superior one, the most excellent, the most sublime. And we get the standard conclusion to a discourse. This is what the Buddha said. Having heard the Buddha's words, the monks were delighted and remembered them well. The Pali version does not have such a formal conclusion. So, <coughs> we get seven qualities. Quality number one is to have a good knowledge of the Buddha's teachings. Quality number two is to understand the meaning of what others say. Quality number three is to know the proper time for or during meditation. We had that little difference. Quality number four in the Chinese version be restrained in behavior. In the Anguttara parallel uh, uh, be moderate with requisites. Quality number five, no one's own strength and weaknesses. Quality number six, able to adopt one's behavior to the assemblies. And quality number seven is to know how to, how to step on, how to move on forward to what is superior, to, to go one step further. And as a result of these seven qualities, one gains joy and progresses to awakening according to the Chinese version, or one becomes worthy of support and a source of merit in the Pali version. So, <coughs> at this point I want to stop and uh, would like us now to have a little discussion. First of all, are there any questions or any comments on these uh, seven qualities or the differences between the parallel versions. The ball is with you. When you have uh, finished writing the chat, you have to hit the enter, so otherwise I won't see what you've written. I saw that some people are typing, but uh, so far nothing has appeared in the chat. <coughs> Alright, so there's one comment here saying, It seems to me that quality 3 is slightly different as all the others have to do with interaction with others in some way, whereas number three is devoted only to the personal activity of meditation. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very interesting perspective to look at it from the, from the viewpoint of whether they have something to do with interacting with others or not. Particular number six is very strong on that. Number five is also very much about about myself, you know, knowing knowing my own strengths and weaknesses. 
Yeah, it's a good perspective to 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 look at them from 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 this viewpoint. It's interesting, and so far as um, I have just uh, recently published a, another article, one of my many articles on the Mahagopalaka Sutta. There is uh, another discourse in the Majjhima Nikaya which has a whole listing of uh, qualities. And there I also find this interrelation between concern for others and concern for oneself. And my basic impression is that obviously early Buddhism is not Hinayana. This is uh, the whole idea about Hinayana and, and, and about selfishness is part of uh, later, later developments and has very little to do with early Buddhism. But early Buddhism puts the need to develop oneself very clearly in first position. And it is only when we have really developed ourselves that we can help others. There is this beautiful simile uh, in the Salika Sutta that just as one who is sinking himself or herself in the mud cannot pull out another. So unless we establish ourselves on firm ground within, we are not able to, to help others. But then we also find in the early Buddhist discourse considerable room given for such concern for others. And it seems to be automatic part of the path to awakening that the more we are liberated within, liberated from selfishness particularly, the more there is room for others. So we always find this, what one of the participants has pointed out in the comment, we always find this interrelation between looking outside, as we have here, especially I found that point six very, very, very useful, really know in what kind of environment we are and adopt our behavior to that. Or point two, when others say something, really try to understand what's the meaning behind that. And then other things which are more about ourselves, like uh, the participant pointed out that uh, the meditation, the quality number three, and then quality number five, I also feel is very much about, about knowing ourselves. And these two always interrelate. So there's uh, another comment. <clears throat> I read it again. It seems today it is considered less important to know the Dhamma well. In this sutta, might the importance of knowing the Dhamma well a sign of shift from practice to preservation? The MA seems to be more practice oriented. <coughs> I think that the importance of knowing the teachings well is something that we find throughout the early discourses. This is this is just just such a recurrent theme that I would not think this is a it's a good question though but I would not think this is a sign of a shift from practice to preservation the shift from practice to preservation is also historically considerably later it's something that occurred at some point in the history of Sri Lankan Buddhism about let's say four centuries after the Buddhist time, roughly speaking, uh, where uh, it was decided that in order to maintain the teachings, uh, the most important thing is to dedicate oneself to the preservation of the actual teachings. Uh, uh, and uh, therefore the practice of meditation was kind of put in second place. But I doubt that this would underlie our present discourse. We have sometimes a little conflict of that. There's a discourse in which uh, Mahachunda has to tell the meditating monks don't look down on those who study and the studying monks don't look down, down on those who meditate. So, so we get this slight friction. But I think the main impression that I get from the early discourses is that knowledge of the Dharma is an integral and necessary foundation for the practice. 
and this is sometimes nowadays overlooked in the especially in the circles modern buddhist circles that give a lot of emphasis to meditation where there is a little bit this feeling that all this uh, theoretical stuff is not really relevant for me all i need to do is practice 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 and for some people that definitely works i have i know cases where people have very well progressed in this way but for others this is not the case and in my own practice i have found that uh, acquaintance with the teachings especially the early discourses has been absolutely crucial for my practice i uh, i like to compare that to yeast the <coughs> the wisdom input that we get from the discourses is comparable to yeast which together with the Tao of meditation needed well gives the kind of input that is needed for the bread of insight to grow that is the simile I like to use for that yeah the another question is about the Nimitta Sutta this is in the Anguttara Nikaya <coughs> It's on page 256 of the PTS edition. Luna Palavaga, this is among the trees of the Anguttara Nikaya. Yeah, and so <coughs> yeah, there, there, there are all this, it's, it's not really a Sutta, this is a kind of collected things in the Anguttara Nikaya, it's there under number 11. But I mean, I can, I can after the course is over, I can, I can just email you the the passage if you want. The point I wanted to make with that was just that this threefold thing we get in the Madhyama Agama is not unknown to the Theravada tradition. There's another question. I'm asking myself why these seven qualities? How do they compare to other indicators of progression on the path as for example the Eightfold Noble Path? Yeah, that is a very good question. I'm also asking myself why exactly these eight and and I would love to, to hear more from you why you think these seven might be relevant. And those of you who have already done courses with me know already the last question you're going to get. What is the practical relevance of all this? I mean, can we, can we make some, some sense out of this for our own everyday life perspective? There's another comment here, uh, why uh, the, I wonder why the Madhyama Agma and Anguttara developed such varying perspectives on the results arising from the seven qualities. Yeah, yeah this highlights another very, <coughs> very, very significant difference where from the Anguttara Nikaya perspective, this is just, well, sorry, I shouldn't say just, but this is about being worthy of support and a source of merit. And in the Madhyama Agama, it's about developing joy and progressing to awakening. So any of you, any, any comments either on the significance of the seven qualities or on how can we make practical sense out of this or on these different, different results envisaged in the two versions, uh, please, you're welcome to write this in the chat box. Or if somebody wants to talk, we can also try if the talking works. But last time we had the problem that this doesn't work so well. And also another problem when uh, you are talking is that I will have to repeat everything because this audio recording I have only records what comes in through the microphone, not what I get through my headers. So f for the time being, I think still typing is the the safest thing for us to continue and I hope in the future we will become more technically uh, sophisticated. Uh, so one question, how can I see the whole presentation? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what this question is about. Um, 
if, if you want to see the whole of the text here on the blackboard, this is only possible when I move things up and down. And uh, for the time being, I have stopped at the place where this summary is. And uh, if you're talking about the whole course that we are doing now, uh, then uh, this will, after we have finished, uh, we have another half hour to go. This whole course will be uploaded on the internet. Uh, uh, you have received a link, this, this OLAT uh, platform, and uh, there you can either see the whole video if your internet connection is good enough, or else you can just click the audio where I'll upload an MP3 file which just has the the, 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 the the talking part without the text and without the video. <coughs> but in the meantime, I can just one time more move through, but I think this will be too fast just to see the discourse, the seven qualities we had, and the first was on all these different ways of knowing the Dharma, this listing of texts, and after each we get this repetition part, and then about the meaning, knowing the meaning of this, the meaning of that, and then knowing the proper time where we had the difference between the settling arousing equanimity in the Chinese version and the recitation, questioning, making an effort and seclusion in the Pali version, and then uh, in the uh, substantial difference number four, the restraint, the clear comprehension, while in the Anguttara, <coughs> excuse me again, we had the moderation. Then knowing, him, knowing oneself, knowing those five qualities of faith, virtue, learning, generosity, wisdom, and eloquence. Knowing assemblies, listing of the ancient, the main assemblies in ancient India, we can apply to our modern day world by uh, saying any different type of group of people, and then this series of superiorities. So while I went through this, there are some more, fortunately, some more comments in the chat box. So one is, if the seven qualities are simply listed, less monk specific, they definitely are conducive to joy in everyday living, avoiding conflicts and growing internally. Quite obvious. That's a good point, actually. Yeah. Yeah, good knowledge of the Buddha's teaching, understand the meaning, know when it's time to meditate, be restrained or moderate. Yeah, I, I prefer the moderate, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no one's on strength and weakness, I thought one's behavior, know how to, yeah, yeah, actually that's true, yeah. Yeah, I feel also more more this gaining joy and progress to awakening really is the flavor that I get from these qualities if I look at them by myself. And uh, perhaps that is just my Western bias and my disinterest in merit, but I would not naturally say, oh, wonderful, now I become a source of merit. <laughs> Another question, will the text not be made available? <clears throat> yeah, that is a problem. You see, um, the Madhyama Agama translation is copyright. And I am I'm, I'm treading in... Uh, a still barely allowable area by taking out little pieces and giving them only to a very restricted circle of people. But if any of you would copy this and put it out on the internet, I would be in trouble because these uh, Numata people have the right to get this translation and publish them. And only after they have published them for, I think, uh, some five years, uh, they will also be made available on the internet. So the interest that my course can give you is you get a first glimpse of this uh, Chinese collection which so far has not been translated into any European language. But the disadvantage is you only get these slight little glimpses and quickly I scroll on <laughs> and uh, the time for you to really read these discourses will come later when the Numata uh, translation is published. I'm sorry about that but this is just the constraints that the present situation puts on us. So here is another, <coughs> I would like to be able to have the text itself as a download so that the notes can be compared with one reads in Majjama Aguna Anguttara Nikaya. Is that possible? It looks as if it might be available as a PDF. Is this the case? 
Yeah, as I already said earlier, the for the Madhyama Agama this is not possible for the time being. What I can offer you is I have just uh, completed uh, 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 the final preparation for the publication of my comparative study of the Majjhima Nikaya, so the Pali version. I have used that as a basis and I've compared it with all its extant parallels. And this I can make available to you as a PDF. So you would have a considerable amount of material to do your own comparative reading if you wish. And I hope that the Madhyama Agama translation comes out this year or next year. So then buying the book from Numata, you would have the actual text. Though Numata allows us only very little footnotes. So many of the differences that we have been discussing here in class will not be noted in the translation. But you would still be able to see that by placing the translation of the Madhyama Agama side by side with the translation of the Majjhima Nikaya by Bhikkhu Bodhi or even if you are able to, to read the original Pali text and in the present case also of the Anguttara. So here's another comment. <clears throat> My impression is that the Eightfold Noble Path goes deeper and is more complex to understand. While these seven qualities are easier to understand as a direct instruction, do this, do that. Yeah, that's actually very good. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Eightfold Noble Path is much more central also to progress. It's, it's, it's so central actually, it's, it's the most central category in the early Buddhist teaching, the Four Noble Truth, the Eightfold Noble Path. So, so I think you are right that we should look at these seven qualities as something more, more, more self-evident maybe and as a complementary to the central teaching of the Eightfold Noble Path. Yes, a good point. But interesting, as you mention it, just I just noticed that uh, you know in the Eightfold Noble Path, uh, the first factor is right view, and this first factor has a very important function because we are told that right view is the quality that acts as a guide for the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path. And here I find that of our seven qualities, the first one is again the good knowledge of the Buddha's teachings. And this uh, good knowledge of the teaching is something to which we will come in another two or three discourses, I don't remember offhand, that uh, we will look at uh, next week. Uh, the importance of, of, of having uh, a good knowledge of the teachings as something that, that protects us and guides us. This, this links me a little bit back to the other comment that was had been made earlier that uh, uh, there is considerable emphasis given to knowledge of the Dhamma. Let me just see if I find it again. Yeah, it's here. The comment was, it seems today it is considered less important to know the Dhamma well. And I find that this discourse really throws that into relief, the importance putting this as quality right on top number one and now the important parallelism or comparison we have made to the Eightfold Noble Path again shows us that this this, this actually stands in the position of, of, of right view as this guiding principle. Good, there's another comment by the same uh, participant. <coughs> Of course, there are also aspects that point into the right direction from my simple understanding of the matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's another comment. You said here and in other places that monks refer to the whole assembly present. How did you reach that conclusion? Well, I have uh, reached that conclusion through my comparative studies because several times there are discourses where only the vocative, the bhikkhavi is used. But those who are actually listening to the discourse are not only monks and it is clear also that the discourse is not only meant to them. So at times it can be only meant for monks, but at times it is broader. And there's one particular interesting case, another of the articles that I've just I'm just about to publish. There's the Dhammadina Sutta, the Chula Vidala Sutta in Pali, I'm sorry, the Majjhima Nikaya 44, and I have uh, translated the Tibetan version, Tibetan parallel, 
and there's a setting is there is a none which according to the commentarial uh, uh, story we are told uh, the story that at least the Theravada tradition holds stands at the background of this uh, discourse is that this nun uh, her husband had progressed to non-return as a lay disciple and had thereon uh, told her that he will not continue his marital relationship as before with her and then she said then, then let me become a nun and she left became a nun, went to meditate, and came back very quickly after that. And uh, in the meantime, she had become an arahant, but the husband doesn't know that. So he goes there and asks her all kind of uh, very deep and profound questions. And there's a little edge to that. He kind of wants to find out if she has really reached some realization or if she has only become kind of bored being in seclusion. And as part of that discourse, <clears throat> I don't know about the Pali version often, I'm just opening it up while I'm talking here, but in the Tibetan version, she also speaks of the attainment of cessation. And it is clear from the context that we should understand that she has actually attained this herself. But she still speaks in terms of a monk. Let me see if I find it here in quickly. Yeah, here also, in the Pali also. So she always says, a monk, a bhikkhu who has attained uh, cessation, he has this and he has that. But it is obvious that she doesn't mean to say that it's only monks who attain cessation get this kind of expense. It's also nuns, obviously. This is just one small example that comes to my mind offhand. But I have a number of uh, uh, such examples found in my comparative study of the Majjhima Nikaya where I note them. Where, where we find that uh, the vocative bika, 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 when used is not meant to give us this impression this is only for male monastics. So we have another 15 minutes. <coughs> I could either still jump to the next discourse or see if you have something to say or if we can get some idea on how to put this all into practice. Yeah, there's one comment here that in the advice to Rahula, rejoicing in one's good qualities is also an important issue. Yeah, that's actually quite true. It's the uh, Rahula Vada Sutta Majjhima Nikaya, 61 or 62, I don't remember offhand. <coughs> yeah. I sometimes see people typing but then nothing comes up in the chest so you have to you have to hit the enter so that I can see what you have written. <clears throat> I think the practical relevance is maybe that the discourse puts emphasis on developing knowledge which is developing the skill of reflection reflection on different aspects of daily life and your own practice. Oh that's a good point. Yeah. I have now already Change so we can't see any more those seven qualities. I still go back to the earlier one. Yeah. 
the other seven qualities again. Yeah, I would like us to 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 balance out. You know, sometimes I'm going to be a little heavy on you with all these uh, theoretical things and so many suttas in this chapter and all this listing of textual types and things. And I think this is also important. This is part of an academic course. But I also like us to to finish our studies always with getting something practical out of it, getting some practical flavor and taste out of it. So here's one question. I wanted to ask something about the text that you are working with. This is just a practical question. Are bits and pieces being found or are extant collections now being translated and made available? The Chinese uh, texts are no longer in the process of uh, discovery. They have been preserved and are available even in digital forms. Only that so far the Chinese um, discourse collections, the early discourse collection, have received uh, relatively little attention. I think uh, many of those who study early Buddhism are not even really aware of these uh, collections, of the existence of these collections. And then one has to really do a lot of language study also, because besides Pali, one needs to know Sanskrit, and one has to learn Chinese, and one also needs to know some Tibetan, because we have several versions in Tibet. And it seems that those who know Chinese uh, are mainly then in the Mahayana field. Uh, Mahayana and other discourses and treatises preserved in Chinese translation have been studied much more extensively. Now, I'm not saying that the Agamas have not been studied, but there is a recent upsurge in study of Agama and comparative studies, of which I think I'm a central part. As far as Sanskrit fragments is concerned, uh, yeah, it seems there's always something turning up. There have been the in in in, in after the political events events in Afghanistan, some uh, uh, very fascinating fragments have emerged, and these are being now uh, unrolled, unpacked edited, studied by various scholars all over the world. And so in the area of Sanskrit fragments, we will always still get new discoveries, new editions, and hopefully also find new Sanskrit fragment pieces. In the area of uh, Tibetan, I think we are relatively limited. The number of uh, early discourses translated into Tibetan is relatively few. But fortunately, there is one particular work by a Indian scholar named Shamata Deva. He wrote a commentary on the Abhidharma Kosha, Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya. This is the a manual similar, perhaps in type, to the Visuddhimagga of the Theravada tradition. And this Abhidharma Kosha quotes always small sentences from this sutta and that sutta and Shamata Deva has had uh, uh, the brilliant idea of providing for each of these short quotes the whole passage or even the whole sutra and this work by him has been lost in India but is preserved in Tibetan translation and so this is a major source of parallels for Tibetan versions but what we have in Tibetan, what we have in Chinese, this there is not much of new discoveries being made. The real new discoveries is in the area of Sanskrit, and I need to add Gandhari, Sanskrit and Gandhari fragments. Yeah, so I think we still have a short look at the next discourse. It's only 10 minutes left. <clears throat> this is uh, discourse number two in the Madhyama Agama. Discourse on the celestial coral tree, parallel to the Pari Jataka Sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya. Again, we get the introduction, standard at Savati. At that time, the Blessed One addressed the monks. When the leaves of the coral tree of the 33 gods become withered, the 33 gods are happy and rejoice. 
saying, The leaves of the coil tree will soon fall. The discourse continues by describing different stages of this uh, coral tree, a uh, magical tree that, according to the information we have, was held to be growing in the celestial realm of the gods of the 33, a tree that has 100 leagues in circumference and the color of its flowers is visible from 50 leagues away and the perfume travels 100 leagues. So the devas rejoice when the new leaves of the coral tree will soon appear. The coral tree will soon grow buds. The buds of the coral tree will soon resemble a bird's beak. The buds of the coral tree will soon open up and resemble a bowl. The coral tree will soon be in full bloom. And when the coral tree is in full bloom, the radiance it emits, the color it reflects and the fragrance it emits spread a hundred leagues around. Then, for the four months of the summer season, the 33 gods amuse themselves, equipped with the five types of divine sensual pleasures. This is how the 33 gods assemble and amuse themselves beneath their coral tree. It is just the same with the noble disciple. When thinking of leaving the household life, the noble disciple is reckoned as having withered leaves like the withered leaves of the coral tree of the 33 gods. The discourse continues by illustrating the going forth with the falling of the leaves, the attainment of the first absorption with the new leaves have appeared, second absorption, the tree is growing buds, third absorption, the growing buds resemble a bird's beak, and the fourth absorption, the growing buds resemble bowls, and the attainment of liberation as the tree is in full bloom. And when the noble disciple has attained liberation, the 33 gods assemble in the hall of the true Dharma and sign in admiration, praise him. The venerable disciple so and so from such and such a village or town, having shaved off hair and beard, Don the yellow robe and having left the household life out of faith to become a homeless one. Having practiced the path, he has destroyed the taints. He has attained liberation of the mind and liberation through wisdom. And in this very life, personally attained understanding and awakening and dwells having personally realized. He knows as it really is. Birth is ended. The holy life has been established. What was to be done has been done. There will not be another existence. This is how an Arahant with taints destroyed joins the community of liberated ones, like the assembling of the 33 gods beneath their coral tree. Yeah, there's only very few differences with the Anguttara Nikaya version. In the Anguttara Nikaya parallel, this proclamation about the Arans with his taints destroyed is also made by different devas. It goes to different celestial realms. Each realm repeats that. Yeah, and the main points of this discourse is this imagery, this, this, this simile we get. Withering leaves is leaving the household life. The growing of buds is the development of concentration by attaining absorption and the flowers in full bloom is awakening. We still have a few minutes time. Any questions, comments on this main points or on the discourse as a whole? The ball is with you again. <coughs> There's one comment that this sutta seems to be drawing an image of the going, the path to liberation through concentration meditation. There is no mentioning of the possibility to achieve liberation through wisdom meditation. Yeah, I think uh, this is an important comment that you make, but I don't think that this is the implication of uh, this uh, simile. 
<coughs> in the in in the in the, in the early Buddhist discourses to 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 assess such things, we always need to look beyond the single discourse. And in general, it is quite clear that the development of concentration alone is not sufficient for a reaching liberation. And I also think that this is not the point that this discourse wants to make to tell us that just by getting the jhanas we will automatically get liberation. I think the way I understand the discourse, and I'm glad you mentioned this so that we can discuss it, is just to 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 to, to show the absorption as an important aspect of the path to full liberation, and to give us this this imagery because. Yeah, they, they could have brought in the different stages of awakening as I'm thinking about it and also illustrated them. That would have made it more clear. But I, I, I basically, what I would like to say to your comment is and that, that the point of this discourse is not to tell us that just by absorption we get full liberation. Because, I mean, it's also mentioning going forth, but it's not mentioning any kind of keeping of the precepts and morality. So we cannot conclude that without keeping morality it's possible to get to full liberation. It's just that it singles out certain aspects of the path to liberation and illustrates these with uh, different aspects of this coral tree. No, but it's very good that you, you mentioned that because uh, I, it hadn't occurred to me to read the sutta from this perspective and it's, it's nice to get the opportunity to clarify that. So, <clears throat> here's another very good comment. Gods are playing a prominent role in the discourse, but it is rather difficult with our background to get much inspiration out of that. So we miss quite a bit. That's actually quite true. In fact, this is one, I have him on the other screen, I have my file with the notes, what I want to say to you regarding each discourse, and I have a note here that I should make say something about gods. <laughs> uh, the thing is that early stages of reception of early Buddhism in the West were dominated by a view of early Buddhist teachings as entirely rational, devoid of superstition. And in some circles this still continues. I do think that there is a kernel of truth in that. The central teachings of Buddhism are very rational. But uh, the entire world of early Buddhism has a lot of mystic elements. There are a lot of gods that populate the discourses and come to see the Buddha, ask him a question, and this all seems perfectly natural and there's also supernatural events the Buddha is born and there's an earthquake and lightning and we get monks doing all kind of magical supernatural performances in the present discourse this is not as obvious as it is in other discourses because we could still consider this a mere parable, a mere simile taken from ancient Indian thought to illustrate the doctrine and I think this is the main implication of the present discourse but and I'm happy that this comment has been made gods and devas and uh, this type of beings are an integral aspect of early Buddhist thought and we would miss out on our understanding of early Buddhism if we were to only look at those rational teachings and not look at these other aspects at all. There's one last comment and at that point then we will conclude because I do not want to overtax your time. Just wait for this comment to come.
The image of the beautiful tree seems very well in accordance with the bliss that is reported by people that attain states of absorption, where the steps of absorption is more delightful than the previous one. Very good point. Very good point. Is the bliss of leaving the household life behind, the freedom, the bliss of absorption, the bud, and the happiness of awakening, the flowers in full bloom. Very well. Thank you, Ben. Is it not a parallel occurrence of teaching a religion of the people at that time? I am not sure I fully understand that. I I think maybe we take up this point next time because we are we are we are getting out of time now. So I think I I, I would like to conclude our second discourse with this uh, with this image of the leaves, the buds, and the full bloom, and the important comment made that that this experience, actually the image of the flowering tree uh, expresses different levels of, of happiness, of, of bliss. Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you very much for your attention today and also for uh, helping me by actively contributing and uh, making comments and putting questions and I look forward to seeing all of you next Thursday.